So, uh, yeah, I guess we can go ahead and get this thing started. Um, my name's Kyle Browning. Uh, this is the native mobile application development talk. Uh, I'm going to start off talking a lot more about some concepts uh, for developing your applications and kind of what you should be focusing on um, when, you, when you start working on your app and, and the things that you should be aware of when you're, when you're working on them. Um, just a, in, a, in a general native sense, not so much as a, a, as a direct connection to Drupal, but uh, it, it does save you, um, you know, some time and energy in the end. Uh, so this is just kind of an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'll kind of explain some whys and why nots for native. Um, I'm sure most of you are here because you want to do native application development. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's good to know the ins and outs of uh, or the, the whys and the why not for, for both sides of, um, of uh, you know, like titanium and things like that. Um, I'll probably go through some, I'll go through some development process stuff. Uh, I'll kind of give you an idea of what the mobile stack looks like, uh, you know, where Drupal fits in, where the phone fits in, and um, I'm going to give you an overview of services, uh, which is, I'm going to cover it kind of lightly uh, because there is a services talk uh, right after this one. Um, that will go into much more detail about um, what exactly services is and, and how it works. But uh, I'll give you a, uh, a good enough um, ground so that uh, you can understand what's actually happening. Uh, and then I'm gonna do, I got some tools and libraries that I wanna show you guys and then uh, I'll get to the examples and sometime after that we'll do QA. Um, so I wanted to start with why not, uh, why not native. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, titanium and being able to support multiple devices and, and, and pushing, to, uh, pushing to multiple devices, that's like an absolute need and you need to do it really quickly. You know, developing natively might not be something that you want to do. Um, if also, if you're rapidly prototyping something, it's a lot easier to write JavaScript and, uh, you know, than it is to do a bunch of memory management stuff, and again, it's 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 just not as hard, you know. Like with when you're when you're writing it with Titanium or App Accelerator or any of those, uh, y you just write a bunch of JavaScript, and, and it you know it builds down and, and pushes to all the other devices, and it's just a lot easier. And it, it's kind of uh, it's kind of um, it, it makes you want to to go down that route, you know, and uh, I, some of the problems that I've had with Titanium are like uh, just APIs didn't exist that, uh, that existed in, in native code that you could, you know, write Objective-C with and, or, or Java and that was always kind of annoying that I couldn't have the latest and greatest stuff. Um, and then there was memory management problems that they haven't, they still haven't solved and things like that. So I personally <laughs> like, uh, like to do native development. Um, so, so why native? I, I've got a lot more talking points here, but it's it's faster performance on the device. I, th I I've always felt that way. Um, you're at, you have a lot more control over what you do. Um, the things that you're working on are actually supported by the operating system makers. So, like Android or or iOS, you can go onto their bulletin boards or their forums and make support requests, and they'll actually you know help you with what's going on. Whereas Titanium, you're kind of you know, like with Drupal, we're left up to the community and sometimes that can be extremely frustrating. So it's nice to be able to, you know, um, pay for something and you actually get support. Uh, like, like I said, you're not waiting on API updates. Maybe you're gonna write a game that's OpenGL and I don't know why you would use Drupal as a backend for that, but, um, and then six for me, it's obviously a personal preference. Uh, so just talking a little bit about the development process here, like you want to get your idea onto onto a piece of paper, and and the reason for that is so you know you, you just kind of get it out there and and try and figure out what exactly you're uh, you're building, um, and then I move on to the wireframes phase. Design is not really something that I do, <laughs> but uh, you know I think the design is a, is a really important part and the. The engineer that's working on any app should be should be aware of what's going on there, and then finally, your actual development. Um, the, getting it on paper will basically help you know the entire process 
um, just go a lot more smoother because you, you know what you're building and it's, you know, not necessarily a moving target. And that's why all of these are, uh, you know, good ideas. Um, it's, it's way easier to fail on an app in your wireframe. Like, I've built in so many apps that they kind of didn't have wireframes. It was kind of like, oh, you know, I want to work on this and I want to work on that. So I go build it and then I'm like, that doesn't really work, right? <laughs> so if you do these things, you kind of lay it out. Um, I have it's easier to fail in wireframes twice because it's important. Um, there's things like briefs, which is not necessarily a wireframing application, but um, it will allow you to write sort of a, a config file that will um, show images, and you can uh, you can actually walk through the entire app that you have with just images, as opposed to you know building it out and, and actually uh, taking all that time and then realizing that you don't want to do something a certain way. Um, examples are like uh, I don't know logging a user in, like sometimes that's an important part of your application and you want that to happen first, but you've kind of buried it in the settings somewhere and it's not really usable. So, you know, you wouldn't really notice that unless you're actually on your device, moving these things around and interacting with your app. And um, that's why I have briefs here and, and things like OmniGraph will definitely help because you can walk through the workflow of your, of your application. Um, I'm probably not gonna spend too much time on <laughs> on design, uh, but you know, there's some concepts here that need that need to be thought out. Uh, is it going to be on multiple uh, multiple devices? And um, you know, you need to you need to attempt to create a user experience that's similar across your website and your and your mobile device. So that's you know that's an important part of the process. And I think that uh, you guys need to like. The developer needs to be involved in that because uh, things change, and sometimes the designer doesn't really understand the concepts behind, you know, the actual uh, development. Um, so yeah, uh, you kind of want to figure out, you know, what your features are for the entire app, uh, you know, when you when you start building, and then uh, you kind of have already done this step if you've you know, done the wireframes and, and the design and all of that. Um, and you should have a pretty good idea of what kind of resources you might need. And that's a services term that I'll, that I'll explain when I, when I get to services. Um, but I personally like to uh, build an API communication layer that uh, is basically just all of the API calls that I'm probably ever going to make in a file or maybe some sort of hierarchical, you know, in, uh, subclass type system on whatever environment you're developing, be it Java or Objective-C. Um, and and that's, that's always given me like a nice, uh, just one place to go to, to, uh, you know, uh, change, change a API call, add parameters, whatever, it's in one spot, and, um, and they're all there, so you can just kind of go through and, uh, and, and change them. And, um, if things are constantly changing, I'd, I highly encourage you writing tests for this API communication file that you've written. Um, and there are tools that you know write that for you for Drupal, um, but I'll get into those later. Uh, and you want to tackle the larger, harder problems first because you know you can be like, oh well, we can just bang out all the easy stuff, and then when you get to like week three and it's the final week of the app and you don't really have any time to, to work on, you know, this large, hard problem because it needs to be on the store on Friday and so it can be on the store next week, you know. Um, so I, I, I highly encourage, you know, tackling the harder problems and, and those are usually like session management, um, just being able to log in the user and things like that. Um, maybe you're doing more complex things like uh, creating you know, types of content on the fly, like writing your own content types and stuff from an app. I mean, um, you know, that's like a really complex thing. So you want to make sure that that you get that working first, and then move on to the to the easier stuff because it's easier, right? Um, so this is kind of the mobile stack as it stands right now. Uh, there's Drupal, you know, is kind of on the bottom, and then there's the services thing that sits in front of it. 
uh, and then you have your mobile app. And, um, and that, I mean, that's pretty much it. Uh, there's some things that can, can uh, you can interject in, in between these if you need to, obviously, um, but that's more or less it. Uh, so I just wanted to talk about services a little bit, which is, it's basically, you know, an API for, for Drupal, and um, it, it allows you to get all sorts of different response formats, so if you have different devices or things that maybe you don't want to include, um, well, up until iOS 5, but pre-iOS 5, you didn't really want to use JSON because every JSON serializer was a piece of crap and would crash your phone. Um, so, uh, but, but that's, that's fixed. Uh, so these are just kind of, I just kind of listed some things here, and this is actually taken from the module page. Um, but it, it, it gives you your connection into, into Drupal, and you're gonna be spending most of your time uh, making calls and, and messing around with, Drup or with services, um, services module, and uh, so it's definitely a part of this talk. Uh, this is, I'm just kind of kind of going to go over what servers are, authentication, how that kind of works, endpoints and, and some versioning, and then I'll just kind of touch on some, you know, some things that might be of, uh, of interest to you. So servers are kind of like this, uh, they're kind of like, um, you basically define what you want to accept response formats, like for example, you create a server, and I'll, and I'll go through and create one later, uh, but you create one and, and you say, I only want to accept application slash JSON, and I'm only ever going to return application slash JSON. Uh, and then you say, I want to do session authentication, which is just basically PHP cookie session management, and, uh, and that's pretty easy to deal with. Or you can go with something more complex like OAuth, and I'll get into those in a little bit. And then it's the, uh, actual piece of, it's the actual object that will um, execute the function call that, that you might be writing. Some of you will probably use the standard services resources. Um, and it's probably something to talk a little bit more about in, in, the, in the services talk, but resources are, are a, for example, we have a node resource, and that takes care of everything that we want to do about a node. We can retrieve nodes, we can create, save, update, delete, right? And these, those are your basic CRUD functionalities. And uh, when the, the server basically takes care of sending the call to, to uh, whatever function that it is based on the path or the parameters that you've given it and things like that. So it's kind of what makes things run. Um, and then you, you know, authentication is probably an important part of, I'd say, most apps. Um, you might be writing some consumption-based things that really only pull in views and don't really, uh, you know, no, nobody's really creating content or tagging content or uploading photos or things. So um, you can just go, you, you don't even have to select an authentication if you want and everything can, can remain, remain anonymous. Uh, one of the gotchas with that, though, is you'll be making a call and you don't have session authentication turned on and you're like, why am I getting 401 unauthorized? Uh, and it's a permissions thing usually and it, it's, sometimes it's not fun to track down. Um, I mentioned singletons here because when you're writing these apps, right, you, you're going to have a user object that's going to exist about through the entire app. So you want one instance of this object and you don't want to create any more, otherwise you could have people that you know, you might, it just kind of gets confusing and, and things like that. So I've always, I've always um, told people that singletons are, are the best thing for, for authentication because your user object is, is not going to be changed and you don't, you don't really want it to. Um, you might be doing some user update stuff, but you know, that, that's like the only time that you would, you would update the, uh, the uh, user on this singleton object. And so, um, and, and yeah, so when, when you do that, when you attach this object, um, most of your calls through your application can just pull that user object from that one thing and then you have a user, you know, anywhere inside of your application as opposed to making the call to Drupal and checking that they're logged in and things like that. Like you don't want to really be doing that. So you, um, it's nice because you don't, like I said right here, you don't, uh, if you do it right, 
um, which I will definitely go into. Uh, you don't need to re-log you know, log in when the, uh, when the app opens. Endpoints are, uh, are another services term, and they're basically the URL that gets generated when you start setting all of this up. Uh, it's, it's basically a configuration object. Um, they're, they, have all, they have all of the uh, resources enabled on them. Um, they, you actually enable the servers on them as well, so the, and what authentication methods you want, um, what response formats that you're gonna accept, which ones you're gonna re return. Um, also, all those, those things are handled on, on the endpoint. Um, and, that, and that's kind of where you can start doing some cool things with like versioning and, and uh, you know, maybe you wanna give some developers access to one thing and some developers access to another thing and you need to separate that out. Um, and, and endpoints allow you to do that. Uh, so versioning is, is, is in a feature branch on versions, and I just wanted to lightly touch on it because I think it's really important. Um, one of the, the, the problems that you'll run into when you're building these a, this API or turning these resources on for your endpoints and stuff is that you'll, you'll break something. Your, your app that's on the App Store will literally break because you added a required parameter, you know, or, or you'll just have unintended function, or unintended features, or I can't think of the word, but basically you don't, you don't want that happening, and uh, versioning allows you to say, hey, this is API version 1.0, you know, and in you, and you, and your, client, your client code, your session management code, um, which is all in that one doc that you wrote with all of your API calls, you can just say, hey, I'm, I want to point at 1.0, you know, and then, then when you, you're sure 1.1's working and everything's good to go, you know, you update everything to 1.0 and, and, and your app will be good. And these people that have the 1.0, or sorry, when you update to 1.1, you know, everything will be good, but these people that still have the 1.0 version, they'll be able to access all of the, you know, old uh, information that, that existed in the 1.0 state. Uh, and, and it's kind of a complex uh, thing that we do on the services side, but um, it, it's in a feature branch and it's, it's definitely gonna be there and I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, and we'll talk about more of that uh, um, in the services talk. Uh, these are just kind of some example calls. I think that slide is kind of out of place, but um, curl is uh, something that you can kind of do in any programming language, so this is just the curl command line and what, what it would look like to get all nodes by topic ID 8, or um, that's not supposed to say get by topic, but the second example is um, supposed to be like user login. Um, and it, 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 it's really neat uh, when, it's, when it's all working. Um, so some things to, to note, Views has um, been in like this weird, ex or services views, sorry, has been in a weird experimental state for some time, but it's actually been very cleaned up. There's no issues in the issue queue. Um, and it, it, the, one of the things that, that I was talking about with versioning is if you start using views to, to you know, manage the content for your apps, you could break your app again by adding or removing a field or maybe you turned on content permissions and now you no longer have access to that field and your users are like, why the hell can't I see my content? So when you're using views, you really wanna make sure that it doesn't change and I suggest using something like features for lack of a better um, module. Uh, there's just some problems with, <laughs> Dom and I were just talking about this actually um, with, uh, changes on production that kind of, you know, get overridden and things like that, but features basically allows you to take that view and put it in some strong ARM code and make sure that it's in code and not necessarily the database so that nobody really mucks with it. And then if anything ever breaks, God forbid, um, you just go hit the reverb button. So you just have to really be careful with, uh, with views. Um, another question I constantly get asked is images inline body content. So Let's say you're using like a WYSIWYG editor on your site and like your, your content editors are just like throwing, you know, their, their 
sunset picture that they took last weekend on the site. Um, so that HTML gets put into this, into this node, and then you, when you display that content body in the app, you, you're like, why are there HTML tags in here, you know? So um, what we have done on, uh, on the services side is basically there's a, there's a module that's in the sandbox right now that I've been working on that basically is a solution that we worked out where we'll strip the images out of the content and basically attach it to the node as if it were a file actually attached to the node. So that when you do um, like a node get, uh, you can, those images are just attached to the node and you can like throw them on the sidebar or if you want, you can put a little tag that you strip out and put the image in yourself with, you know, whatever. But you get more control over where those images go. You know, a lot of the times you don't want them in, in the middle of your, you know, content body on the, on like the iPhone or the so, um, I, and I highly recommend using image cache, uh, you know, just because it's awesome. <laughs> and I guess in, in seven, you don't really have to install anything because it's core. Um, these are, these are just a couple of tools that I wanted to, uh, to tell you guys about um, and talk about a, bit, a little bit. There's, those URLs are kind of hard to read and I apologize, but I'll leave the slide up for a bit while I talk about them. Um, there's the, there's a, the Drupal iOS SDK, which is basically, um, and I have a mobile stack picture here for it, uh, that just kind of sits right in front of services and your mobile app, and, and Dios and Dandy are both libraries for um, the iPhone and Android so that you can natively communicate with Drupal um, extremely easily, and uh, they're, 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 they're there to, to help you um, move things along faster. So the iOS SDK has all this code written to do your session management and your user management. I mean, I'm sorry, they're the same thing, but do your user management, um, get all of your nodes, get views, basically everything that's in services core is supported by both of these libraries and you can get your app up and running in, in way, way less time. Um, because you're not worrying about like all of the things that I've been telling you that you need to do. <laughs> uh, the majority of it, you know, I, I, I still write that API communication file, but it just calls functions that exist inside of these libraries. Uh, so another great one is services log, which is just kind of hooks into services and, and logs everything. Um, it, it, it'll allow you to see that when you're, you know, getting a 401 unauthorized, it's because you, uh, you know, you're, you don't have the permissions to access it or something along the lines of, um, you know, you sometimes, uh, uh, you basically need to be able to see what's going on. Like, you know, you, you forgot a field and you can't figure out why. So you, you turn logging on. It's a lot easier to go through Drupal Watchdog than it is to, you know, dump objects in an editor and crawl through them and stuff. I like the way it Ray's look in Watchdog personally. Um, so yeah, so now I just kind of wanted to show you guys some of this stuff uh, and maybe see if there's any questions yet. Um, there's a microphone in the middle of the room if anybody wants to walk up and ask a question. Otherwise, I'll just continue on. Cool. Uh, and did, it, did, did everyone get a chance? Did anyone need to see this slide any longer? Probably not. Uh, so the examples that I'm going to be showing you are all on the uh, iPhone, um, just because I don't have an Android emulator on my Mac. Um, but this is uh, sort of, you know, you get into native development, I don't know what you guys are familiar with and things like that, but this is sort of, you know, your environment that you're in all day. Uh, so I'll just go through and show you guys kind of what services looks like and stuff. Uh, and what, what you need to do to kind of get your app up and running. Um, so I'll just go right here to services. Uh, this tools example is actually supplied by a module, but um, services API is one I wrote. I, I'll just make a new one, but I'll be using this one um, during the demo just because I know it works and I don't want things breaking while I'm showing you. Um, 
so when you when you add an endpoint, you basically you know it's it's pretty standard. Uh, we give it a name, so we'll just call it you know new endpoint, and then you select your server. Like I was talking about, you you have multiple options. This was REST or XML RPC. Um, you there are others. There's like I said, there's SOAP and 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 multiple others, but we're just going to stick to REST because it's a lot easier than a, than a XML RPC in my opinion. Uh, and we'll just do your your path to the endpoint is is uh, and I realize that's kind of hard to read. But um, your path to your endpoint is basically what uh, you're gonna call when you when you make these calls to uh, to your API. Um, this debug mode is add some um, let me zoom out here. The debug mode basically adds on uh, um, some extra watchdog functions that are useful. Um, it's kind of a work in progress. I think services log does a much better job than, than uh, services actually does. Uh, and then you choose your session authentication methods. Um, and I guess I didn't really talk about a little bit about OAuth and might probably something that you guys are interested in because in services 2x there was this API key that everybody loved but um, there was like we would just get security advisories like once a week because it was just it was just a really complicated way of um, handling all of that so uh, I, I highly recommend using OAuth you can use what's called the two-legged authentication method which is you just sign your requests and send it off or if you want to get fancy and you have like a, a, I mean it's a prime example, Facebook does it, uh, Twitter does it, they all do it, um, is OAuth, uh, three-legged OAuth authentication which is, hey this is who I am, I want access on this other site and they send you to that site and then they say hey log in, we need to verify that you're you and then when you log in they send you back and say hey yeah you were verified and now you have a user object and you don't really have to give uh, your login credentials to like it, it basically was created so that you didn't have to give your login credentials to other people like a developer that wrote an app could be malicious and just record all of that information over the course of time whereas with OAuth it sends you to the original site and you don't really have to uh, you, you, you trust that site. Uh, obviously, if that gets you know broken into, then you have bigger problems. But y you basically trust that it, it's it's a lot like OpenID, but for APIs. Uh, so I'm just going to choose session, which is like I said, standard PHP cookie stuff. Um, can't have spaces, so let's just do new endpoint. Uh, and so yeah, this is all on C tools, so you're probably pretty familiar with this if you use views. Um, the server settings here are basically your response formats, and I can't get it all on the screen, but um, actually, there we go. Uh, so you have your selection of response formats. JSONP is not selected by default because it's kind of, you have to know what you're doing there. It, it allows you to do uh, cross-site requests with JavaScript and things like that. So um, it's turned off by default. Same with application uh, XWW form URL code. There's some, some security implications there that people need to be aware of, but that's not for this talk. Um, I'm just going to leave on what's on, uh, but for the application, we, we only need uh, JSON. Uh, so I yeah I don't even need to do anything there. There's no settings for session authentication. Uh, if you were using OAuth, this is where you would select your context for, hey, this is what um, consumer uh, context that you want to use for this uh, for this endpoint. So you can say one endpoint is session authentication, and that's trusted people, and then everyone else gets to use OAuth. Um, these are a list of, uh, of all the resources that I was talking about, and this is kind of like where it gets into what your actual, how you're actually interjecting data into interjecting data into Drupal. Uh, I'm just going to expand this real quick, and you can see the API version stuff because I have it, I have it checked out. Um, 
this is a list of everything that we can do with comments. Uh, we can create, retrieve, update, delete, and index them. And then we can do give me um, a count of all of the numbers on a given node, which you could argue um, that it should be in the node section. Uh, it's just this is where we put it. Uh, and then count new, the number of new comments on a node. Um, you know, pretty standard stuff here. You, I usually just turn these all on, but um, you know, not, on a production site, you probably don't need to turn on like file maybe because they're not uploading something. Um, file is it's basically the same thing. Um, and one thing to note here, there's a create raw function because currently the create function uses a base64 encode, um, which is kind of bad on uh, mobile, mobile devices really because you have to uh, you have to base64 encode the entire file. So if your file's like 5.5 megs, you better hope you have that in memory available to base64 encode that. And if you don't, your app will crash. So create raw function uses a multi-part form encode. Um, and you have to, uh, just another gotcha, you have to enable that in the, uh, in the server down here. So, um, that's just an idea of what, of what resources are. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and turn all of these on just for funsies. Uh, and, and then there's obviously the, the uh, export. Um, we, this is all based on C tools, so you can do some hooks and get the, all of the stuff in code. There's a little bit of work on the OAuth side to get that, that configuration management in code, but um, services is, uh, is all C tools based, so. It all works. Uh, yeah, so here is um, just basically the, it's, a, it's this, the site. Uh, I'm going to clear cache just because I always do it. Let's clear it twice. Uh, and I just have a question here that I that I that I did, and I I I wanted to work a lot more on this app than I had the time to do, but um, there I I tried to think of an app that might like you know uh, show a lot of things, um, and I, and what I came up with was a a question app so that you guys could ask questions during the uh, during the um, speech, but. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to get either of those on the either store, so that's not happening. Uh, but I have an app here that I can show you on my emulator. Uh, that's sort of those exact questions that you saw. Um, the test one is anonymous. Uh, you can do all sorts of things, register and log out. And um, I'm going to go ahead and attach this to my Xcode real quick. Uh, so yeah, um, you know, if we go in here and we we delete that test node that I that I made, that's pointless. Um, you can actually see that when we rerun the app here, it's not there anymore. Um, so this is all using Dios, the library that 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 I was talking about earlier, and it uses this file right here. Which let's see if I can. I have a much better screen resolution than this projector. Uh, so I know this code probably looks like very scary, um, but this is the this is like the 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 basis of the node object, and this gives you all the things that you can do to communicate with Drupal. So Here's a node save, right? So you just basically pass the, the node, and it will call your session. Um, it'll post to that path that gets generated based on some static variables that I have set. Uh, and then it'll, it'll call a delegate. I've actually updated this to use blocks a lot better. Um, but I didn't have time to do it for everything, so. Uh, that's kind of the heart of, of, of the Dios library and, and or the node the node part of that. Uh, I don't even know how to get that back. Is 
really? All right, so we'll use this. Um, so just looking at some other ones, uh, just like adding a, adding a question, which I'll, I'll, I'll do here in a moment. Um, this is the create a question function. Uh, let me make that bigger for you. There we go. Uh, it's pretty straightforward Objective-C code, nothing fancy here, just kind of creating a hashed array and, uh, or a dictionary and um, sending the data off. As you see here, I, there's some tricks to filling in the content for, for uh, services because it all uses uh, Drupal form execute or form submit, whatever it is in seven now, um, whatever it is in six. Um, so you'll, you have to basically build your node exactly like it looks on the devel screen. Um, if you have a, where a lot of people get, get confused is if you have, um, if, you, if you look at the, in seven at least, if you look at, at, at field body, which is a field now, it has a language array with, with an indexed array inside of that and then another hashed array inside of that that has like raw values and safe values and things like that, you know. So you have to actually build all of that and, and, and send it off. Uh, but it's pretty straightforward if you just look at the develop tab and you know, you know how to build basic array structures in whatever language, you, language you're using, be it Java or Objective-C, you should be fine. Uh, and as you can see, I'm just making an array with objects with the question body text and setting some keys like Let's see if I can go down there. The value, you know, the value, and the, there's that UND that you see there. Um, let's do this. Is that easier to read? You guys are awfully quiet. Uh, anyways, UND you see there. Uh, that's that language variable that I was talking about that exists in seven and it's kind of really annoying, but it is what it is. Um, so yeah, we just call our, our, we instantiate our DS node object and then we init, init with our delegate, which will basically, that's gonna change a little bit, but uh, for right now it'll call back uh, node save did finish down here. Uh, and that's kind of where I, you know, I could probably do, be doing a lot more things here, but um, I hide the heads up display and then I, uh, I check that the status is true and if it was, then I, I dismiss the screen. So let's just show that really quick. Um, like I said, I'm not a designer, so don't, don't laugh at my program. Um, so since nobody had any questions, I'll have to make one up. Uh, we'll just do, we'll just do, you know, um, why does base64 encode, how about why is base64 encode so lame? And then I added a session name just because um, I was gonna try and make it usable for all of the sessions, but uh, I didn't wanna start <laughs> I basically didn't want to uh, do all of the work of getting all of the session information and importing it into this Drupal site. If I had DrupalConChicago.com's database, or, or sorry, DrupalCon Denver, uh, it would have been a lot easier. Anyways. Um. And then the question would probably be, it's, this is just like an extended field, so I'm just gonna. That's not what I copied. All right. Whatever. So, uh, I wasn't logged in, so my username's not showing up. I apologize for that, I should have logged in. Uh, but as you can see, it added the node, it, it, it refreshed and did everything it was supposed to do, and if we go back to Drupal, there's our node. Um, so it's pretty, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh,
Thank you, thank you. Um, the same stuff exists for, for uh, Android, so don't worry about that. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to show you guys uh, kind of an example of, of, of all of that, and I, and I think that that's kind of where I want to leave things off and see if there are any questions. Yeah, come right up. Okay, so uh, we've got an app that we're building that's still in the it's still in the uh, in the wireframe design stage, but uh, we've got we've got nodes that we're wanting to push that are going to have you know somewhere between 60 to 100 images a node, and video. And so one of the challenges I know we're going to have is to try to push these things um, and handle the potential of a dropped connection or different things like that. So I, d I don't see that we're going to be able to push you know. Like we've got to find a way to, like not atomically in the database sense of the word, push the, especially the image and video data. Do you have thoughts on that challenge? Um, I mean, obviously, uh, you can do all sorts. Uh, not necessarily with the images, but um, one thing I didn't mention is caching and caching and responses and stuff like that. But. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a tough problem, and you definitely don't want to load all of that for every node every time it, it comes up, you know, and so um, I would probably write a custom resource to get to just basically, you could, you could probably use views to do it, but I would write a custom resource that batched those images and gave me the ones that I wanted. I would try and solve it that way. Uh, if you need all of the images for the node, then you need to figure out how much you're going to display to the user and actually do the batching yourself. Right, I'm, I'm actually talking about pushing the images from the, the, the iOS device to, that's, that's my concern. Oh, okay, I'm, so I'm this not, user's gonna select 100 images on their phone? Right, so they're doing an inspection of a, of a piece of equipment, for example. Oh, okay. They're going to take pictures. And I, you know, like we've done some tests, but the challenge we were into and, and you, know, um, you know, breaking connections is trying to figure out, you know, Drupal's kind of, um, kind of uh, difficult to just upload you know, a piece of information per node, unless you get down to the database or make fields are required, do some kind of yeah. Check stuff. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's a tough problem. Uh, you're going to need to batch the sending, um, basically, uh, and do it in the background, uh, you know, unknown to the user. And if anything fails, just run it again later, um, you know, and make a note that it failed and try and figure out why. And if it's just a network thing. You know it sucks, but we can't really do anything about that. Uh, and and it, compressing the images obviously helps. <laughs> do you have any uh, thoughts or experience with exposing Drupal Search or Solar uh, through a mobile app? Um, I have done some testing with like exposing the uh, search form, which would give you basic Drupal search. I don't know how that would work with with Solar, but I would imagine since Solar does the same exact thing using the search form, that the integration would be very, very similar. But services doesn't expose? Solar? Services does not expose okay. by core. Um, there might be a contrib module that does, and we're more than willing to support anything that's in core Drupal, but we're not gonna, there, all of the maintainers agree that we're not gonna support things like Five Star. That's for Five Star to do. They, they use our API to, to write the integration, and the same could be said for Solar. Um, but for, like for, for core Drupal search, we definitely want to have that in there, and it's just not done. So could you do something like exposing it through, I know there's Solar for views, so you could maybe expose it that way? Yeah, you could probably do that. Yeah, because we, all we do with views is, is a views execute and, and grab the results, you know, so. Beginning, you uh, mentioned two strategies: uh, either code generation from JavaScript or writing your own full native uh, application. What about uh, native HTML, uh, HTML5 applications? Wouldn't that sort of solve the problem about missing libraries? You can melt, at least on Android, you can melt uh, the local APIs to uh, JavaScript. Do you have any experience with the uh, uh, native HTML5 applications? Uh, I, I have done some na native HTML5 application stuff. Um, the, the, we just need to write a JavaScript library that does the same shit that, that Dios and, and Dandy do, <laughs> basically. 
and then that, that problem will go away. Um, but yeah, you can, you can definitely uh, make those same, um, you know, let's say you're using jQuery or whatever, you can just make a request to the URL um, and it will return your response. And I can show you some of those responses if you want. I think I have one up right here. Um, this was, I'm, I was changing stuff, but I was gonna create a note here. So this last response here was I logged in and that was all of my information. Uh, so you can see my session ID, you can see the set cookie getting returned um, when it expires and all of that stuff. Uh, just get, I might be out of date here, but could you give an update on OAuth and security? Um, I understand like OAuth 1.0 is half, right? Yeah. And then, and services originally supported, so, so what is the status of OAuth? And OAuth 2.0 is not final. Right. So what is the status of using OAuth with, with services? Uh, so it works. Um, I've, I've tested it in both six and seven. Uh, seven's a little bit more wonky with OAuth because uh, I actually just recently picked up maintainership and I haven't gone through the issue queue yet. <laughs> um, but it does work. Um, OAuth 2.0 will be supported when it comes out. When that happens, I don't know. Right now, it's, it's not in the pre-draft or whatever it is is not in, um, and it's only OAuth 1.0. Uh, but they work in both six and seven. Yeah, so Friday, my day consists of a documentation sprint for both services and OAuth. Um, hopefully we can get through most of that, uh, and if anyone is willing to come help, that would be awesome because, um, you know, we're the developers of this stuff, and sometimes we use the app because we know how it works, uh, and that kind of makes your documentation, um, you know, poor quality because um, you just using your app uh, and, and using your code, you kind of get accustomed to how it works and, and then you just kind of skip over that step when, you, when you're trying to explain it to other people. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, well the talk that's going on right now with Krell, uh, Larry Garfel Garfield, um, the whole, uh, uh, WSSCI initiative, whatever it's called, uh, is trying to do that. Uh, they haven't really been in communication with us about getting services into core or using the same methodology or how did we solve these problems. Uh, and we've tried to be involved in the, in the past and we just kind of didn't really get it going anywhere. So we just refocused our efforts on, on, on making sure that services is, is great quality code and that it, and that it works. Um, I would love to see the base, the basics of services in core, um, but I, you know, if that happens, it's going to depend on the community. <laughs> yeah, actually, that was one of the questions I wanted to put in the app. Um, so the question w was, uh, ASI HTTP request in Dios uh, and ASI HTTP request is no longer supported by the original uh, developer of that, that um, CF networking library for iOS. So the code that I have written, um, actually rewritten, that is in a feature branch for Dios, which is supposed to be Dios 2.0, um, uses AF networking. And they fully aim to support ARC, and this fully supports ARC um, on iOS. And um, yeah, so it, it, I've already moved it all over to AF networking and gotten rid of ASI HTTP requests. So uh, you can download that now and mess around with it. It's it's all in a in a in a feature branch on on uh, this GitHub page. Yeah, you're gonna have to rewrite it. Um, I, 
didn't really do any sort of um, backwards compatibility because session management handled, is handled differently in AF networking and they kind of take care of a lot of the cookie stuff for you. So I also wanted to get rid of, um, I wanted to make it fully asynchronous and so DOS 1.0 is, is not uh, by default, but you can do sort of things like network operate or um, uh, operation queues and things like that. Uh, but yeah, uh, for um, sorry, I lost my my train of thought there. But yeah, does that answer your question? Or okay, yeah. So if you yeah you you're gonna have to rewrite it. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but that's why I you know that's why I suggest putting it all in that one file because. You really only have to touch that. That updates everything for your API, and as long as the responses are the same, you should be good to go. Anything else? No, all right, well, thanks for coming out, guys. I appreciate it.